So for this talk, I have titled it The Nano Launcher Concept and a Holistic Approach to Reducing Launch Costs. My name is Matthew Travis, and I am founder and COO of Aphelion Aerospace. So for this webcast, what I did is I pulled out a presentation that we made about three years ago uh, at an informal roundtable discussion with New Space NYC. And I thought it might be interesting to see if what we talked about then is still relevant today, considering that our industry, specifically the small launch industry, has changed and grown dramatically over the past few years. Before I start, I, it's ironic uh, to note that today Rocket Lab launched their 20th mission, including their first test flight, and unfortunately uh, the second stage failed and the payloads did not make it to orbit. Uh, even in the 21st century, space is still hard, so uh, we all send our sympathies and some of us our empathies to the team over at Rocket Lab and I'm sure they will find the cause determine a solution and press forward uh, forthwith so to start out we have a basic question what is the smallest orbital rocket you can build this was the question that got us started with Aphelion several years ago, actually. And, and we took it beyond just the engineering of the smallest orbital rocket, but also extended the question to what is the smallest orbital rocket you can build and profit from? Because if you can't make a profit, you don't have a business, obviously. So there are two key, key questions. First, what is the most suitable technology for your particular uh, small launch vehicle? And for our purposes, we are talking about nano launchers, so even smaller than small launch vehicles. And then, how do we find and affect elasticity in the market so we can leverage economies of scale. That involves economies of scale in regards to flight rate, manufacturing rate, as well as directly relating to the vehicle size itself because you also have economies of scale that scale down to your advantage. It's not just about scaling up. So for a point of context, uh, we think our industry right now is at a key turning point compared to other transportation industries, other technology industries. We can look at the Douglas DC-3 aircraft, which really enabled passenger air travel on a mass scale and cheaply. Prior to then, only the wealthy could fly. You couldn't fly anywhere and everywhere you wanted, whenever you wanted. Uh, the DC-3 really commoditized air travel. And we see how the airline industry has progressed since. Uh, the Model T. No longer are automobiles being custom manufactured one at a time, sometimes to a customer's specifications, but they are being mass produced to achieve an, an economy of scale in the production rate. That enabled efficiencies in manufacturing costs that also, also directly related to the price point of the vehicle. Uh, however, you know, Henry Ford, he didn't set out to build necessarily a $500 automobile. Or rather, I should say, sell one. What he identified was that there was a market potentially for a $500 car. And then he set about 
how do we do the engineering to achieve that? And that thus resulted the Model T. After a number of iterations, there were, you know, from the Model A down. Uh, more recently, although for the younger folks in the audience, um, ancient history maybe, uh, the cell phone revolution, not, not iPhone, um, not your Android smartphone, but going, uh, you know, more than a decade prior to the, the time when we went from the big brick car phones that you, you know you can see in uh, older movies where the, the the millionaire has a giant phone next to his head and it's plugged into the car battery and all that we went from that to the mobile cell phone uh, Nokia Motorola uh, they were key players in that and that began the commoditization of the cell phone again identifying a potential market because at the time people were like why do I need a cell phone? I've got a phone on my wall in my kitchen. Um, so there was a lot of skepticism for the cell phones, believe it or not. But they identified a potential market and price points and established the manufacturing, marketing, and processes to bring those products to market and uh, uh, spur the mass adoption of cell phone technology. Key here is, in all these industries reducing manufacturing costs increasing reliability prior to the DC3 air travel was not for the faint of heart um, even after the DC3 you know safer than car travel they would say but but still um, you know always advancing safety um, Model T was such a simple car. I mean, it it didn't necessarily never break down, but it was easy to fix. I mean, uh, easy and cheap to fix. Uh, all of these mass produced, mass produced uh, on assembly lines or somewhat assembly lines. However, all three of these industrial revolutions required significant massive capital expenditure to build out all of the infrastructure. And that is one of the barriers for the small launch industry when it comes to amortizing over time those development costs to meet, to meet your goals of reaching break-even profitability and then eventually an acquisition or an exit. So uh, let's take a take a look at the launch industry from what may be a, a different perspective than than you may be used to. We start looking at the history, and it, the launch industry has gone through cycles. Uh, we start here in the '80s, but it, it actually has a history cyclical even before before then. So in the 1980s. Uh, particularly after the Space Shuttle Challenger accident when NASA was prohibited by the Commercial Space Launch Act of 1986 from, you know, flying commercial satellites anymore. This was meant to spur the private sector launch industry, and this is when the, at the time, McDonnell Douglas Delta II rocket uh, was commercialized. It, they transformed it into a commercial launch service. And the General Dynamics uh, Atlas Centaur, Centaur was also commercialized. The Titan III they attempted to commercialize and it made one launch and it was too expensive to be commercially viable. Uh, on the demand side this was the birth of direct-to-home TV. This was when uh, cell phone technology started to come about, even though cell phones ended up being a direct competitor to satellite communications. Uh, there was all this technology development. This was also the time, particularly 1987, when, guess what? 
the Internet was developed. Uh, before then, it was called ARPANET. It was a research project. In 1987, it was officially uh, basically put out for public use as the Internet. So there was a lot of launch vehicle speculation at the time, and a number of companies started up during this time. Space Services Incorporated of America, uh, Dolphin, or actually it was, a, a, it was called Arc Technologies, Dolphin was their vehicle. They ended up evolving into American Rocket Company, uh, Third Millennium Incorporated, and uh, a host of other companies. Uh, it's notable to mention that uh, every single one of those startups is now taking a dirt nap, so to speak. None of them found long-term success. Uh, so the end of the 80s saw the commercial market dominated by Atlas, Delta on the U.S. side, Chinese rockets, the Long March, and the Russian Proton. Uh, and that was pretty much it. There was uh, the startup market really had, it was not getting good traction. In the 1990s, uh, we saw GPS uh, reach maturity from its first launch in 1989 on the first, I believe, commercial Delta II rocket. There was an abundance of, of capital uh, looking for places to invest in space. Uh, this was also a time in the early 90s that NASA was planning one of its many uh, programs to return to the moon and eventually go to Mars. The International Space Station, at the time uh, named Freedom, was in design and development. So there was, space was big in the early, early 90s. Then Leo Broadband came about. It was going to be the next big thing. Massive constellations of huge satellites flying across the sky. ICO Teledesic, Global Star, Iridium, and others, they all had these plans. They never materialized. And one of the questions is, why? Did they just have bad business models? Were they had bad engineering, bad management? Um, and no, they had good technology, uh, good management good business plans except short-sighted and they had blinders on. They did not anticipate the growth and commoditization of the cell phone. Instead of all of us walking around today with satellite phones, we have cell phones. It was cheaper to develop the cell phone technology and the infrastructure, all the towers you see everywhere, then satellite phones. You could, buy, you could buy a cell phone much cheaper than a satellite phone. And it was more reliable, uh, I should note. Uh, I recall uh, being on a project, a balloon launch rocket project we launched from the Gulf of Mexico, and for the boat and the, the uh, shore-based mission control, uh, we used Global Star phones. There's only one problem. Global Star had no coverage in the Gulf of Mexico. I exactly where you'd think they would have it, you know, give your coverage where terrestrial phone cannot offer. They didn't. They tried competing with cell phones. And so we couldn't even communicate with our boat. The phone and the expense was pointless. We ended up having to use the good old ship-to-shore radio. Uh, so th that's a fundamental uh, failure of that industry that dissolved um, to be able to identify not just their own market potential but other other industries and the threats. So that, uh, during that wave, there was more speculative uh, investment in startup launch companies, um, some owned by billionaires like Beale Bank with Beale Aerospace. 
Uh, and again, none of those companies, uh, you know, succeeded because they all were basically dependent upon this next big thing actually coming to fruition. In the early 2000s, the talks started about space tourism. Space tourism. We had the X Prize. It's still a work in progress, and hopefully, you know, in maybe a couple months, Blue Origin will fly the first suborbital space tourist. Uh, later this year, early next year, private astronauts will be flying to the International Space Station. But that's been a 20-year 20 uh, 20-year process. Meanwhile, during this, uh, Elon Musk founded SpaceX. He identified an actual market and an actual demand and needs and has been pursuing it, even though his ultimate goal is, you know, humanity thriving on Mars. It's still a business, and for SpaceX to do that, they had to identify how to make money. And uh, they identified market, uh, multiple markets, and they are serving them today. So that brings us to the 2010s and now the 2020s where finally we have a cycle that is paying off. We now have multiple private launch vehicles like Rocket Lab, uh, Astra, Virgin Orbit, uh, who also have made it to orbit. Um, and that industry is growing. And the market is growing. The, the demand side is growing. So this is a, like a, another new space revolution that is taking place. It's something that, you know, in our business we've been, you know, anticipating and advocating for 30 years, uh, but it is finally happening. And part of the reason is the space, well, I'll call it the SpaceX effect. Um, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. Nothing attracts success like success. When SpaceX became the first private fully private company to place payloads into orbit on their own vehicles you know and generate revenue that opened the floodgates for the whole industry um, without SpaceX we, we would likely not be where we are today additionally uh, you know we're talking about constellations again not these huge satellites but like Starlink um, or Kuiper, you know, smaller satellites in greater numbers um, for communications, IoT, global broadband. So the, the demand side is also growing. So, you know, what are the lessons learned? As you see here, you know, each wave is higher than the other. That's a function of, you know, a growing global economy. Uh, and technological advances, uh, but the risk is still there. In each one of these cycles, there is still risk. Uh, I mentioned Rocket Lab's recent failure. That was the, the third failure out of their 20 launches. That's not an acceptable failure rate long term. That's 85% success. The space shuttle was better than that, and people hated it because it failed. So there is still risk and even though uh, Rocket Lab is a, a healthy growing company you know nobody is immune uh, from the business cycle uh, look at Astra they have launched uh, I think three times three orbital attempts um, and they still have yet to get to orbit and you know they need to so in each one of these cycles Almost all of the companies have failed to deliver. Uh, you know, that's not really unusual in business. You know, I, I give the example of the restaurant industry, and I think I saw a figure once where like 98% of restaurants fail within the first three years. Uh, that may have, be a bit exaggerated, but there is a high failure rate. So, 
companies have to survive business cycles and they have to survive failures. And in many cases, the business plans are based on optimal uh, scenarios with too little room for when things go bad. We saw this just last year with COVID. Uh, a lot of aerospace companies went under because they could not survive. Others, like us, basically went into somewhat of a hibernation mode, uh, trying to conserve uh, precious dollars. Uh, but, you know, as an entrepreneur, one has to anticipate a worst case scenario and then plan for something three times worse. You know, a, a COVID pandemic. Um, you know, we could plan for, you know, a three month downturn in the economy. You know, that's a mild recession. Even if it's extreme with stay at home orders, a few months a business plan can usually absorb it. What very few of us anticipated was a year-long event, which is still going on. Uh, but we need to do that. Any business needs to do that, not just aerospace. So, I'm not going to play this video. Maybe I will. So I'm going to take you back to what is really a, was a seminal moment in the commercial launch industry. Um, many people don't know of this uh, or remember it because uh, it was now almost 40 years ago. But it was the launch of Conestoga One. And no. So I'm going to talk about two of the pioneering companies in the commercial space launch industry. And both of these go back to the 1980s and early 1990s. First, there was Space Services Incorporated of America, uh, founded by David Hanna. And they went through some challenging times early on. Their first uh, launch vehicle was a liquid fueled rocket called the Percheron, designed by uh, Gary Hudson, uh, who we've all, we all know who he is. And their first Percheron, uh, they attempted to do uh, static fire tests in preparation for launch, and the rocket blew up because of a frozen liquid oxygen valve. They did not anticipate the humid Texas air condensing on, on the valves. So the valve didn't open all the way, uh, overpressurized, blew up. Uh, their launch site was Matagorda Island on the Gulf Coast of Texas, approximately midway between Houston and Corpus Christi. I've been down there. It's a rather desolate area. Following that, they switched course Gary Hudson parted with the company. David Hanna hired Mercury 7 astronaut Deke Slayton and was advised to switch to solid fuel rockets because they are much more reliable. That's, um, that's a debate in the industry which is more reliable. Um, the argument is a solid fuel rocket, you can't turn it off, 
So if something goes wrong, it blows up. Well, with liquid fuel rockets, it's very similar. You know, if something goes wrong, it either blows up or it shuts down, and you still have a failure. Again, just like Rocket Lab today with the shutdown of the second stage. Uh, so they called their new rocket Conestoga-1. They launched on September 9th, 1982. They reached space. It was a suborbital flight. Uh, the first privately owned and managed rocket to reach space. Uh, however, they did not design and build all the components. What it really was was a variant of a spare... Um, Ares suborbital rocket, a DOD vehicle, based on surplus Minuteman III motors. So they integrated and, and flew it, but they did not actually manufacture everything themselves. And that was their whole plan, uh, was to be more of an integrator. Their orbital vehicle, as you can see in the middle picture, uh, they had a whole family of them. This was the only one to reach the launch pad, and it was called Conestoga 1620. Uh, it had six solid motors strapped around a core motor topped by the upper stage solid motors. And it made one launch attempt, which uh, I will show you on the next slide. And around the same time, there was a company called American Rocket Company, founded by uh, George Koopman, who was an eclectic uh, person, to say the least, and also somewhat of a, a genius type figure. Um, he's most, was most well known as the, uh, the person who did all the special effects for the Blues Brothers movies, or Blues Brothers movie, uh, with John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd. Uh, sadly, he passed away, um, a couple months before Amrock's first uh, test launch um, in a car accident driving home from the launch site. So it was very tragic. But you see on the right photo uh, their suborbital test rocket and they called it uh, Single Engine Test 1, Set 1. Their orbital rocket would cluster multiple of these modules together. In October of 1989, AMROC attempted their suborbital test launch of the SET-1 single module vehicle. And here we see... Damn it! In October of 1989, AMROC attempted a suborbital test flight of their single module vehicle called SET-1. This was out at Vandenberg Air Force Base, and the results were less than satisfying. As you can see, the engine ignited, but the rocket never went anywhere. Uh, a frozen or seized up liquid oxygen valve resulted in far less thrust than was planned or necessary for the vehicle to get off the launch pad. The resulting fire also burned out the electrical system to the rocket and the team lost control of the vehicle. It also burnt out the mechanics to re-engage the hold down clamps and it weakened the launch mount and eventually the rocket toppled over onto the pad. The Conestoga 1620 made one orbital launch attempt in 1995 after three or 13 years of development four, I believe, four solid motors ignited on the ground. And one thing about solid rockets is they have a, a lot of vibration uh, in them. 
due to the way they burn. And when you cluster them together, the control system has to compensate for that and, and adjust to the vibrations. Well, on the Conestoga, the vibrations overwhelmed the control system, which then ran out of hydraulic fluid, and essentially the rocket flew itself apart. This was out at Wallops Island in Virginia, and the pieces splash down offshore in the Atlantic Ocean. Neither vehicle ever flew again. <clears throat> AMROC continued for the next five years uh, on R&D. They conducted a number of ground test firings of their hybrid motor, uh, but they were never able to get the financing they needed to really commercialize their vehicle after that first um, failure. And in 1995, uh, AMROC closed their doors. Interestingly, a company called SpaceDev purchased their IP to continue their own hybrid rocket development. Fast forward to the X, the, the, uh, uh, the X Prize in the early 2000s, and the hybrid motor on Spaceship One was a direct descendant from AMROC's work. So, uh, and that technology continues with Spaceship Two and Spaceship Three. So, you know, the, the research and development that AMROC conducted still lives on in some form. Space Services Incorporated, however, uh, by the time the Conestoga launch took place, uh, they had been bought by a company, EER Systems. They won a contract from NASA uh, to launch the Comet mission, an experimental uh, small payload. And they had their launch failure in 1995, and that was it. Um, EER, after that, essentially closed down the space services, the Conestoga operation, and it, it faded away. Uh, I'll note that in addition to Conestoga, in the years between 1982 and 1995, space services also conducted suborbital uh, sounding rocket missions um, and generated revenue from that. A company called Celestis since then purchased all of the assets of Space Services Incorporated consisting mainly of the name. Celestis is the company that will put your ashes into orbit or deep space um, but they're not building and launching their own rockets and they're not in the business of commercial satellite launch. So neither of these companies were able to overcome uh, a single failure. The single failure basically ended up being the nail in the coffin for each of these companies. And unfortunately, the history of our industry is littered with companies that similarly had a single failure and you know, resulted in, in the demise of the company. Now I'm gonna go, I want to go back even further, and this is a real interesting story. Uh, OTRAG, they were actually the first privately owned launch company in the world that we know of. Uh, founded in 1975, uh, OTRAG stands for Orbital Transport und Rocket AG, and AG is the German Incorporated. So, Orbital Transport and Rockets Incorporated. Their idea was simplify the launch vehicle as much as you possibly can. Buy as much as you can off the shelf, um, as simple components as, as possible, as simple a design as possible. So, their vehicle was made up of these modules, which they called common rocket propulsion units. 
They were 12 inch diameter steel tubes. They would cut them into 6 meter lengths, put in bulkheads, and make tanks out of them. Uh, nothing custom made for rockets. It was just bought from an industrial supplier. Uh, so it was not mass optimized or anything like that. The engine, simple engine design, used an, a, an ablative thrust chamber and nozzle, so no regenerative cooling involved. Uh, no pumps. Uh, they would pressurize the tanks to 600 psi. Uh, they would only fill them about two-thirds, and the other third of empty space they would pressurize to uh, 600 PSI and use that pressure to force the propellants through the engine. They used propellants, uh, nitrogen tetroxide, and, and uh, uh, not even kerosene, but they also used diesel at one time. Um, simplify the ignition system as, as much as possible. Um, and then commercial production techniques, like I mentioned, industrial piping uh, and the like. So an extremely simple vehicle. And, and now for some technical reasons, it likely would not have been able to do the job that OTRAG wanted. Uh, there are certain engineering requirements uh, and performance requirements that have to be met. The rocket equation still holds true. Um, so it was ambitious and admirable, but it, it may not have been um, technically doable. Although the founder, uh, Lutz Kaiser, uh, to his dying day, he believed in, in the concept. He actually kept uh, parts of the rocket at his home on a Pacific island where he retired uh, and actually just they were making a documentary document document documentary uh, about OTRAG back in 2017 and so a few months before he passed away he uh, participated in it and he showed off some of the hardware so one thing that a company has to be aware of are legal constraints, political constraints, geopolitics, you know, things other than rocket science. Um, and so OTRAG was a German company founded 30 years after the end of World War II. There were still certain restrictions on aerospace activities that Germans could be involved in. Uh, but more than that, Russia, France, England, and the United States did not like the idea of Germans <laughs> building rockets. Um, simple, simple as that. Uh, still bad memories from, you know, World War II. So, Lutz was advised uh, by a boxing promoter. Uh, who organized championship fights like Muhammad Ali's big fight, championship fight in Africa. He was advised to go to Zaire. So he did, and the dictator of Zaire leased out 100,000, 100 100-something 100 thousand uh, acres, no, square miles of territory for them to use as their launch and test site. In exchange, he would take 10% off the top. Uh, one of the and one of the folks at OTRAG remarked, "You know, they call that corruption, but to me, that's that's less corrupt than the West, where the corrupt politicians usually take 100%." Um, but being in Zaire was not desirable to France, Soviets, U.S., and African countries because Zaire was being run by a dictator, propped up mainly by the United States and Western powers. Don't get in bed with dictators. Uh, you'll see in a video coming up, one of their test launches, and Lutz Kaiser is standing there with the dictator of Zaire Mobutu. And that's 
probably not the best marketing material and probably not what private investors would want to see. Uh, so eventually Otrag became problematic uh, for Mobutu and they relocated to Libya. Another dictator by the name of Muammar Gaddafi. You can imagine how well that went. Um, obviously none of the world powers liked that. Uh, Gaddafi was rather open that he wanted weapon systems to result from this technology and he actually um, held technology and assets hostage from Otrag when he kicked them out of Libya. Not the best. After that, in the 1980s, they did do some test launches uh, out of Sweden. Um, the uh, the S-Range uh, launch site. Um, but they had failures and finally in 1987 uh, Otrag shut his doors for good. Um, but this was the first attempt at a private orbital launch company and I think the most unique story out of all of them. Uh, there is a documentary, documentary, I can't say the word, uh, which you can find on YouTube uh, called Fly Rocket Fly, I do believe. You can just look up Otrag and Lutz Kaiser. Uh, it's a very, very interesting story. So here's that test launch in Zaire. There's Mr. Dictator and there's Mr. Kaiser. One of the four engines had a valve problem immediately. The rocket didn't go very high. Still suborbital, um, but they had actual successful launches prior to this. That's why Mobutu decided with no notice to show for this one. And he wasn't too happy, actually. Neither was Mr. Kaiser. But again, it's a test flight, so they say if it gets off the pad, it's a success. So you see how they clustered these modules together. Uh, we talk about something with rockets called mass ratio. Uh, you know, your hardware mass and your propellant mass, how do they compare? And ideally, you want at least 85% of your rocket to be propellant. This one didn't get anywhere near that. But it was still a very interesting concept. And um, the company out in, in Mojave, Interorbital, uh, run by uh, Ron and Randa Milliron, uh, they are following this type of concept with their Neptune launch vehicle. And prior to his death, uh, Lutz Kaiser was uh, providing uh, advice and consultation on it. So the concept lives on. Okay, so enough with history. Now we go to, all right, so here's where we are today. What is our end goal. What is the nano launcher dream, as we call it? Uh, simply put, a way to make launches become less expensive, smaller, more numerous, and more available by a factor of thousands. Thousands is rather aggressive. Um, I would be happy with a factor of tens, maybe low hundreds. But here's what's required. Here's, here's how it needs to be. Daily scheduled launch with airline-like ticket manifesting. You know, you buy a ticket for your satellite, and that gets you a seat on the rocket. And you know when it's going to fly, where it's going to fly, where it's going to fly from. We need an order of magnitude cheaper dedicated launch for one satellite on one rocket. I'll give some flexibility here and say, you know, maybe up to a dozen, depending on the rocket. 
but to me, that still falls within conceptually the, the concept of dedicated. And essentially, launch total launch price for a dedicated launch of less than $1 million. We're getting there. We're not quite there yet. Hopefully, uh, Aphelion will make that a reality. The markets out there, you know, we've talked about it. You see it all over, you know, the media and the web. Constellations, orbital debris cleanup, uh, prospecting of resources, exploration missions, you know, beyond low Earth orbit, etc. We need to enable all of these mission types with a cheap nano launcher, cheap and reliable. Getting them their dedicated orbit with no wait time. If I want to go to asteroid XYZ123, I have a very specific trajectory I need to follow. And most likely, no other spacecraft has that same requirement. I want to get me a rocket that can take my payload to that trajectory so I can get to my asteroid. One of the high cost factors for the customer, it's not just launch. Oh, we pay so much for a launch. It's all of the costs surrounding the preparations for that launch leading up to it. When it takes months to years to plan and execute getting a payload to orbit, that's months and years you're paying people to work on the mission, you're paying for the spacecraft to be maintained and stored. You know, there are additional costs. So we need to be able to build, launch, and operate spacecraft within weeks to months, not years. So we need standardized components, uh, standardized vehicle and spacecraft hardware, standardized processes and software, and, and really drive down the timeline to get to orbit. Um, if we meet these, I call it, call it objectives, uh, we can achieve essentially cheap, reliable, on-demand launch. Uh, I won't compare it to being the Uber of spaceflight because there is another company that is using that comparison, so I shall defer to them out of respect um, but but yeah on-demand rides to orbit and low cost so now uh, let's look at the nano launcher story at the top left here I'll just mention is the SS520 dash I forget what it is uh, Japanese rocket it is the smallest rocket to send a payload to orbit. The uh, smallest by size, I don't know about by mass. Um, it's based on sounding, uh, a sounding rocket, so the payload environment is a bit rough. Very high acceleration, uh, high vibration. I mean, it reached orbit in just a few minutes when normally it takes eight to nine. Uh, not not done so much to be a commercially viable vehicle, uh, but just to show it could be done. Um, the first real nano launcher, believe it or not, was Vanguard. Its standard payload was around 20, 30 pounds. Vanguard 1's satellite weighed 3 pounds. Uh, the grapefruit, as Khrushchev called it. Um, it was a very advanced rocket for its time, more advanced than anything else in the world. Uh, it is still, if you look at the engineering, it is still somewhat of a marvel, marvel uh, to see what they were doing with the technology they had available. But being as advanced as it was, it ended up not being reliable enough and it got superseded very quickly. There was a project in the 1960s or 70s, 
not SNCC, uh, an air-launched rocket. Uh, it never successfully placed a payload into orbit, but it was another uh, nanolauncher. Uh, somebody I knew back in the day, he passed away a few years ago, Charles Pooley, uh, founded Micro Launchers LLC. Now, they had an interesting concept, uh, which I personally don't believe uh, was technically viable, not to mention market-wise, but their idea, kind of like OTRAG, uh, simplify everything as much as possible. Uh, they wanted to put uh, a 50 to 100 gram payload into orbit with as small a rocket as they could build, as cheaply as they could build. So, for example, they would use soda can type architecture. A soda can is a pressure vessel, after all, um, but not exactly commercially viable. Microcosm, uh, Jim Wirtz's company, proposed similar in concept to the Conestoga rocket, uh, but liquid fuel, uh, called Scorpius clustering multiple smaller liquid fuel rockets together. Um, and they they have been pitching that for really since, I guess, late 1990s, early 2000s. Um, but for whatever reasons, they have not been able to actually commercialize it. Uh, as I look at Microcosm's activities over the years, uh, they seem to be focus more on R&D contracts with the government than operating a commercial launch service, which is, that's fine. Um, but they, they did, they have proposed a very interesting and, uh, I think, doable uh, small satellite launcher. Then there's Vector Launch. Um, you know, when we first did this presentation, Vector was the talk of the town, <laughs> um, and everybody was getting compared to Vector, and, you know, I, we would get asked repeatedly, well, are you doing what Vector's doing? Uh, Vector's doing this. Are you doing something like that, too? You know, uh, nobody thought Vector would fail, uh, but they did for a combination of technical as well as management reasons. You, you know, you, you can read the literature in the media. Uh, you can go to the, uh, I believe it's Maryland, bankrupt, I believe it's the bankruptcy court in, in Annapolis, Maryland. You can look up the vector launch bankruptcy and download all of the docket files from the court proceedings and it explains exactly you know where vector went wrong. Um, Unfortunately, I had many friends who worked at Vector at all levels, and I respect all of them, uh, but sometimes with a startup, even if you have launch contracts and, you know, almost $100 million investment, sometimes a business can slip out of your control and end up not being viable. Um, which just goes to show, you know, all these companies of the 80s and 90s failed, but it is still very risky today. You know, even without COVID, uh, Vector Launch declared, well, they shut their doors in August of 2019, declared bankruptcy uh, in October, I think. And that was before COVID. Um, so I can't blame COVID on that. Being in the launch business is the hardest business to be in. I actually don't recommend anybody start a launch company. Um, is it worth it if you succeed? Maybe Elon would say yes, but... There's a lot that goes into it. 12 plus hour days, seven days a week. Sacrifices of family and time. And always living under the ever-present threat that tomorrow 
it could all end. Uh, that is a real big lesson looking at the history of this industry. Most of these companies that are no longer with us didn't find a measure of success but not enough and struggled and then sort of died out. Uh, most of them either limped along not making progress and then just shut down, gave up, uh, or over nearly overnight shut down. <clears throat> um, even the executives at Vector Launch did not have a lot of heads up and lead time from the investors that they were pulling their investment. Uh, it even caught them off guard. So, would I recommend anybody do it? Not really. But also, no, once you do it, you can't get out of it. Uh, the principals at Vector Launch are now working on other launch initiatives, you know? Uh, so, it's as much a way of life as it is a business. And that's the history of rocketry, going all the way back to Robert Goddard. Uh, so that's just something to think about. Well, let's get down to brass tacks about the business. First thing any business needs to do in any industry is figure out their costs that relates directly to your growth rate and the value of your company. There are a few cost model uh, methodologies out there. One is grassroots. Uh, basically, you itemize everything, all of your label, labor, materials, overheads, every single component, price them out, even if it means getting quotes from industry and then picking the cheapest one or whatever, um, and coming up with a granular, very detailed cost, mainly cost of goods. We're talking about cost of goods sold. It's time intensive, intensive, subject to heavy bias. Again, do we buy a cheaper component or more expensive one? Do we buy 10 of these at a discount or just two? Um, but worst of all, it's unresponsive to inflation without continuous recalculation. Prices change constantly. Materials, components, labor, uh, taxes. If you use the grassroots model, you have to recalculate basically no more, no less frequently than every three months. Um, that's not very efficient. There's parametric model where you look at other launch vehicles, other rockets, other companies, or your own previous experiences and you extrapolate from that what the costs are. Problem here is you can't always identify what all of the costs are. Uh, you're more limited to a, a higher level uh, breakdown. Then again, as well, if you're relying on previous endeavors to estimate your costs, then you're tying your own system and processes to that previous experience. So, for example, Relativity, they 3D print their rockets. For their cost modeling for that launch vehicle, they can't use previous experience in other companies building rockets because they're not related. Relativity could ditch the 3D printing and go with a different method that is more appropriate to that type of cost modeling, but then they'd be throwing away their business model. Uh, so parametric, the, the utilization of parametric modeling uh, is very constrained and really it's it, it's only applicable when you are uh, evolving a family of similar launch vehicles. Here's version one of our rocket, here's version three, version four, 
then you can start to do parametric. Then there's what we call munitions and aspirational modeling, uh, where you we look at not just space launch vehicles, but launch, but rockets in general, other industries. Uh, you know, see the picture on the right, the standard missile two uh, costs four hundred thousand dollars in total. They can find out some of the cost breakdown there. We can look at automobile production, mass air, mass produced aerospace equipment like aircraft, and here you have to try to draw analogies. This kind of suffers from the same issues as parametric because you're you're trying to compare apples to oranges and say an orange costs this. So what does the apple need to cost? Well, you can't. Uh, it's it's very difficult. So in the end, there's a combination, really, of all three of this type of modeling that goes into play. Um, and then as you go through your R&D and you actually start to know what your costs are, then you can update your modeling with your own uh, experiences and concrete numbers. So here's an example of uh, an ant now now antiquated. I remember back when it was revolutionary. Uh, small launch vehicle, not an anti launcher, but a small launch vehicle. The Pegasus, the air launched Pegasus, from Orbital Sciences Corporation, then Orbital ATK, now Northrop Grumman. Total price it varied over the years because it went from high demand to low demand, and so price went up. Uh, it varied. Uh, between 20 and 60 million, but on average in a year, uh, price around 40 million. Uh, a price NASA was willing to pay, but not many other people. I'm not sure how many non NASA missions it even made. Uh, but we look at the cost breakdown. Uh, we found this out in our research. Propulsion, over 25%. Labor, 25%. Assembly labor, another eight and a half. Uh, two key hardware systems, the avionics and flight safe, flight termination system. People don't realize in the small launch industry, the nano launcher companies continually underestimate the time and cost to develop and certify both of these systems. Um, uh, right now, Rocket Lab is having challenges at Wallops Island getting their flight termination system certified. The structures is relatively small percent. Um, another big factor is the amortization of your DD and E, which you do have to take out of your launch price because uh, you got to pay back what you've already paid in with your development. Now, with Pegasus, the propulsion was twenty-five point seven percent. Uh, ish. A lot of that was just the propellant cost and the fact that the motors were uh, the way they were procured. For a liquid fuel rocket, the propellant cost is a tiny fraction, uh, single digit percents at most. Uh, so then the, then the objective is to reduce the cost of the propulsion system hardware. So if you have a lot of precision, high-performance valves and cryogenic systems and, and uh, custom, uh, custom welded and assembled hardware, it drives up your cost. So one of our objectives is really to uh, drive the cost of the propulsion system down extremely. Uh, and I'll get into that. A, a bit later as to how we're going about doing that. So here's another uh, uh, another thing that goes into the cost uh, cost problem, uh, which I call the vehicle mass fallacy. The vehicle mass does not always directly correspond to cost. Some components scale well with mass. 
the propulsion system and propellant. At an analogous scale, propellant cost is minimal. And scaling the propulsion system is relatively easy due to the square cube law. We should look that up. Uh, we could double our thrust of our primary engine without increasing its cost because it is that small. Uh, there'd be, sorry, the only, the only cost increase would be in the raw material. Uh, if you look at this picture here uh, on the right, there's a 2,000 uh, kilogram thrust, don't know why we use kilogram force, uh, engine, and on the right is 10,000 kilogram. The one on the right has five times more thrust cost twice as much. So you get a good scaling with good cost scaling as well. Uh, and we take advantage of that in our system. We're not designing a single large engine. So for a nano launcher, the greater priority lies in reducing the cost of operations and production. Those are directly proportional to vehicle size and complexity. And I will add here that reliability is directly proportional to vehicle size and complexity, but inversely. The smaller we make the vehicle, the more simple, simplified we make the vehicle design, the more reliable of a launch vehicle we will develop. So these synergies actually work well, uh, very much in favor of the nano launcher. Uh, a note on vertical integration. Now, for a startup uh, trying to manage low uh, low capex, it is oftentimes necessary to do a lot of outsourcing, whether it's COTS components or custom components built by a third party. And this is because there's a lot of capital that goes into uh, designing and building out a factory. Um, you know, you can spend easily $50 million on a factory for a nano launcher. It'll take a long, a long time to amortize and pay back that investment. So when you're in a highly competitive aggressive industry with short timelines and no tolerance for failures or budget missteps just to get to orbit you may need to outsource a lot of your labor and hardware however as you grow and as you get meaningful investment into your company to grow the company uh, you need to start vertically integrating your processes. So, look, for example, uh, in some industries, especially aerospace, you can have 10 layers of management and overhead and paperwork, qualification, to produce a simple component. Um, so, to, to, to build an actuator for an aircraft. You have the actuator company, goes to the avionics company, goes to the electronic component distributor, however many more intermediate suppliers, eventually getting to the steel mill and the mine. However, in the automotive industry, and I'm not talking like Tesla, um, but in automotive industry, it's much more streamlined. The, the actuator company can go directly to the manufacturer of the metal components who then goes to get the raw material. So there, there are fewer uh, middlemen involved. Each one of these middlemen, by the way, takes a profit off of their work, so it increases your costs. And that's one of the challenges between vertical and horizontal integration is getting your hardware and your systems uh, to market rapidly 
versus most economically. And sometimes those two uh, desires butt heads against each other. Uh, what some companies do, I guess most, uh, and, and what we're doing is a combination of vertical and horizontal. Very few companies are completely vertically integrated, and very few companies are completely horizontally integrated. Um, there's usually, it's a balancing act to see what is optimal for your business at your stage of growth. But ideally, in the long run, a company could be uh, completely vertically integrated. How, how, do you, how do you make that happen? How do you bring everything in-house? You need high, high quantities of production. If I'm making three of whatever component a year, I'm not going to spend millions on all the tooling and hire full-time staff. I would never get a return on that investment. So you need high production, which means you need high demand in the market. Uh, instead of treating your rocket like a space shuttle that has to be built in this 23rd century, which a space shuttle wasn't, uh, you know, 23rd century high-tech uh, assembly facility that looks straight out of Star Trek, you need to build it light industrial. Yeah, you need to keep the air clean. Um, not that clean. Uh, you, you don't need surgical room cleanliness uh, like you do for certain spacecraft like Mars probes, uh, which actually needs more than surgical room cleanliness. What you need to do is utilize light industrial facilities, hardware, and processes. Leverage COTS systems where it makes financial sense and address your reliability concerns uh, because when you do bring everything in house you do have control over everything that affects reliability but then it's also your responsibility so now you're hiring a bunch of uh, qualification personnel and the like um, and then there's supply chain because even being vertically integrated, you still need to have a supply chain. Uh, that's fairly mature right now, but for certain niche applications, it is not. Uh, for example, uh, we have some unique requirements on our launch vehicle that we're building the expertise in-house because there is no expertise in the industry to do it. So we have to do it ourselves, and that's just another uh, another fact of life in the in the space launch business world. So then we get to R and D approaches, and one one word I will give is flexibility. You got to be flexible. Um, especially when you're developing something new because there isn't a standard playbook of how to do R&D where you can just tick off check boxes and end up with a product, especially in space launch. So you have to, we have to keep in mind that recurring costs and R&D costs are not your friends. R&D costs essentially are sunk costs before you generate a dime of revenue. Recurring costs burden you pre-revenue and after you're on the market. So how do we balance those? Well part of it is between in-house and outsourced technologies. The more you outsource sometimes you can lower your R&D costs, but you increase your recurring costs with outsourced technologies. 
sometimes it's valuable to outsource, sometimes it's better to do it in-house. So you need to have that, that balance to, to make sure that you stay within your cost targets and more importantly maximize the return on investment according to your stakeholder expectations. That would be your investors. Because while they may not be doing the engineering work they own the company as much as you do and oh by the way investor agreements usually give your primary investors great leverage on whether or not the company is going to continue uh, just ask anybody who worked at vector launch uh, prototyping uh, we've done prototypes every company does prototypes uh, and this this goes into manufacturing as well uh, custom sizes versus industry standards uh, and this this applies to length mass volume materials custom materials versus industry standards when you stick with industry standards you can lower your manufacturing costs you can also lower your costs for outsourcing because you don't have to have anything made custom or designed custom uh, the smaller your launch vehicle the more the easier it is to do this uh, we can for example pick a standard in industry diameter of our tanks and outsource them some components just buy straight off the shelf if we had a vehicle the size of a, an Atlas V that becomes a lot more difficult to do and then even the industry standard tooling to manufacture the hardware is wildly expensive um, so nano launchers are, are much more flexible and much more amenable to using uh, industry standard and COTS components uh, sizes and, and, and metrics then we also asked, do you want to do a lot of hardware prototyping or extensive simulation? Really, there's, there's a, a blend. Um, but it's, we're not at the, at the day anymore with most companies where they'll do the design and they'll build a test vehicle and launch it to see if it works you know and then like fail five times before something actually works we're not we're not in that type of an industry anymore um, and no investor would go for that they're not wanting to you know essentially give you money to throw stuff away so we have to rely on a lot of simulation we cannot do full-scale prototyping of a complete vehicle and then you know, just keep our fingers crossed that it works. Uh, we need to simulate it, uh, refine the design, simulate again, refine the design, because when we do get to the launch pad the first time, there needs to be a reasonable probability of success. So large scale prototyping is essentially out the window. What we can do is small scale, subscale engine, uh, things that we can produce cheaply, get the data we need, and throw away. Uh, because there are certain aspects of rockets that even though you can simulate them, you still need real-world numbers, real-world data, real-world observations. Uh, but we are moving more and more toward uh, heavy heaviest reliance on simulation which by the way does keep your hardware uh, and your labor costs low when you know when you're simulating a design you don't have to hire people to actually build that design yet that comes later uh, so these all factor into what we feel are appropriate uh, an appropriate R&D approach uh, for nano nano launcher development um, and this is kind of how we're pursuing our um, our plans and our vision.
I think I maybe should have put this slide first, uh, because it all starts with the organization you build. Um, in a startup company, early stage company, in a company, in an industry that generates as much excitement and emotion as uh, Space Launch, the makeup of your organization and its structure is critical. It's not simply a company owner hiring people with good resumes. Uh, if, if that's your approach, you're going to fail. Uh, I tell people, uh, show me an entrepreneur who only hires resumes and works 40 hours a week, and I will show you a failed entrepreneur. So both startup and early stage, as well as mature nano-launcher companies with primary in their objectives, in their list of objectives being low price, for the customer, you absolutely have to have a lean operation. You have to have resources dedicated to meeting the tasks that need to be accomplished. Essentially, you have to operate with efficiency above 100%. Uh, that's just a fact of life. And anybody who thinks they know enough that they don't have to do that, again, is a failed entrepreneur. You have to have sufficient resources to survive failures and uncertainty. Whether it's launch failures or uncertainties brought about by global pandemics, you have to have the reserves. You have to have the investor support to carry you through those. Your investors need to understand that historically a third to a half of your first 10 launches will fail. That's the history of the industry. Uh, it's not that bad anymore, but uh, you know, if they're not accepting of failure, if, if the milestone they give you is reaching orbit on your first launch, you don't want them as investors. Because if you don't reach orbit on your first launch, guess what? They're gone. They will lose confidence. They don't believe in you. That's the other thing is your your supporters and your investors and your employees have to believe in you and believe in the cause. And it has to be presented as a cause. Uh, the companies we reviewed earlier in this presentation, Amrock, SSI, uh, and there are others, essentially they had one failure and they died. They could not survive even a single failure. Uh, if you're if you're in this business and you are dependent on your first launch being a success or your first ten being a success, uh, you might want to rethink. Also, if you're building a launch vehicle, you're not generating revenue to get a launch contract. That could be several years into your R&D phase. There's a huge amount of capital expenditure that has to take place before a single dollar of revenue for launch. That's unlike, uh, you know, the uh, uh, the API industry, web apps and mobile apps and things like that, where you can have very little capex on the front end and go rapidly into generating revenue and then any of your investment goes strictly into scaling the business um, that's not the launch industry so another thing with investors is if they do specialize in that type of investment they may not be appropriate for your company uh, you really have to vet them out and discuss with them in detail just what they'll be taking on, uh, which is essentially their entire investment being spent before they get even a dollar back. To help mitigate that, uh, in the venture capital world, there's what's called minimum viable product, MVP. Not most valuable, but minimum viable, or most valuable. Um, 
So essentially, your long-range goal is to offer this product or this service. What can you do to generate revenue in the meantime? So this is diversification. Components, systems uh, that you are developing, if you can put those on the market earlier, sooner, to generate revenue, that will help support your business as well as support it if there's an economic downturn or, or uh, development setbacks. Two examples of this would be, like for our launch vehicle, the flight termination system and the avionics. Those will be complete and certified before, long before we launch a rocket. We can put those up for sale before we even have a rocket on the launch pad. So we can generate revenue from those even before we have launch revenue, even though those are components that we are developing for the launch system itself. Uh, I, I call this monetize everything. As you go through your R&D process, uh, keep an eye out for any, any hardware service or system that you can actually monetize to generate revenue. Also, very critical is managing your overhead. It might look awesome to have the fanciest, slickest, most modern looking factory with the slickest, newest, you know, CNC machinery and a building that is just packed with employees. That's most likely not the right way to go about it. You're incurring far more overhead than you need to complete your research and development. This goes back to lean operation and dedicated resources. A lot of times investors are pushing growth, 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 growth. How do you increase the value of a company? You grow it. A problem with a pre-revenue launch company is if you grow the company too much too fast before you're generating revenue, you're not growing the value of the company, you're in a sense decreasing it. Because all you're doing is spending more and more and more. Oh, they call it investment. Investment equals valuation. It doesn't actually increase the worth of the company though. It merely increase the need for more investment to cover those costs. It, it can be self-defeating. Um, and Vector Launch is another example of, of that. Uh, they sought investment, got investment, grew, sought investment, got investment, grew. Lost focus of why they existed in the first place, and that was to develop this rocket and launch payloads. Instead, they, they, you know, they're eventually at the time of bankruptcy. They had, I think, 150 employees, uh, only a fraction of which were working on the rocket. Uh, they branched out into the Galactic Sky uh, software-defined satellite uh, service, which that's a a fine business, but not appropriate for them at the time. Uh, it was spreading resources too thin and requiring too much investment other than focusing on the rocket. Uh, even though we all want to be more than just a rocket company, we want to offer comprehensive, all-inclusive services, uh, not just launch. Launch is what takes the most capital to commercialize. So you can say, oh, to your investors, we're going to be offering this service and that service and this system on the market and generating revenue from all of that. But the fact is, you're asking for their money to build a rocket. So to the industry, you may not be a rocket company. To your investors, you are, because that's what they're investing in. So managing overhead is critical. Leverage interns and volunteers. 
where you can, when you can, because there are legal restrictions and requirements that come into play. Like, you know, don't hire an intern from Iran if you're building a launch vehicle in the U.S. Um, but interns are different than, than it was like 50 years ago. 50 years ago, interns was free labor that you could bring in to do the things that you didn't want to do yourself, like clean the bathrooms. Interns today, in my opinion, are as knowledgeable and as skilled as many full-time career people in the industry. The one thing they're lacking is the years of experience. So they, there's less experience, but I don't think there's necessarily less knowledge, other than, other than knowledge you get from experience. Uh, but what they do possess that someone in the industry for 20 years might be lacking after 20 years in the industry um, is the excitement and the passion. This goes back to what I was saying about you're not hiring a bunch of resumes. You're hiring people. They need to believe in what you're doing and believe in the cause. They need to be passionate about it. They need to be excited about it every day. Going home should be the sad part of the day because they're not working until they come back the next day. Um, I find interns is one of the most enthusiastic group of employees you can have. And note I said employees. Some interns you can get free still, um, but in our industry, internships usually come with uh, an hourly wage, ten, fifteen dollars per hour. Uh, so there are employees. Uh, they may be short-term employees, twelve weeks in the summer, but they're employees, just as much as a full timer is. Treat them that way. If you have an intern with leadership skills, leverage that for the time they're with you. So they can so that when they leave, they're not just leaving behind a bunch of bolts that have been turned, but they're leaving behind some of their knowledge and experience that the rest of your team has absorbed. Don't diss out on interns, because also interns can be your future full timers. Many, many people who work at SpaceX full-time for their careers have gotten their start as interns. Uh, keep that in mind. And going along with managing overhead, you know, keep your team small and agile. You don't have to hire people just so you look like you're a growing company. You don't have to hire people just so you can impress your investors with how many people you're hiring. Um, or government agencies. A lot of the government agencies providing incentives, like tax incentives, um, they, always, they, they usually put in a requirement that you hire a certain number of people by a certain date. And if you don't, you end up in the news for underperforming. Um, for a small startup, just avoid it. And, and be honest. Uh, even if it means turning down a two million dollar tax break in Florida for a building, be honest about your business. And say, it is not in our business interest to hire 300 people in the next year. We can't afford it. If we could afford it and did it, our business would still fail, we believe. That is not our business model. We have a need for 50. We're not going to hire more than 50 unless we need to. So we're not going to promise more than that. They may turn you down, may invite you to walk out the door, um, but they will respect you for one thing. Uh, the people they talk to will respect you. Other opportunities will open up and fundamentally you're staying true to your business. You know, don't start lying about your business. Don't start lying to yourself about your business. Don't start promising to change your business into something else just because somebody with a checkbook wants you to. You know, stay true to yourself and stay, to, st stay true to your business. That 
that holds valid in any industry, but I think especially in the ultra high risk launch industry. So now I'm going to take a divergence into the larger picture uh, with the industry, specifically economics. So here's historically how the launch industry has worked. If you look at this at this graphic, you see uh, demand for higher reliability, leading to longer schedules and fewer emissions, which leads to higher launch cost and higher emission cost. And why is this? Because the payloads, the spacecraft, are huge and very expensive. Uh, $500 million to a $1 billion for a communication satellite. What this has resulted in is a lack of market elasticity. So, in the launch industry, reliability has been the determining factor prior to SpaceX. The launch vehicle could not fail, even though they failed at a higher rate than they do today. Because of that, the launches were pricey. So instead of building three satellites, you would build two larger spacecraft with more capabilities for two launches. Each launch then itself became more expensive. Meanwhile, your development schedule became longer, the launch provider launching fewer missions, all of which drove up the cost. And then you have a market where there's few launches, few launch providers flying in frequently. And it's like this a death spiral of higher cost. Um, so I, you know, not even a decade ago, there would be around 10 or fewer launches from Cape Canaveral, and each mission cost on average between 150 million and 350 million in launch costs. And there's no way to bring that down with a market that size. You know, your, your, your cost per launch can't be spread out over multiple missions, multiple launches, more than you have, because the demand is not there. The launch industry itself encouraged large spacecraft. That's why you look at the, for example, the Delta rocket. started out as a Thor missile with a solid propellant rocket on top. Eventually it grew and grew. They widened it, they lengthened it, they added solid motors to it, they added more solid motors to it, they upgraded the main engine, they evolved it to the Delta IV, all of which to carry larger and larger satellites more expensively. And consequently, you know, if I'm going to pay for a Delta IV launch that has a certain payload capacity, you know, the launch price is not dependent on the size of the payload for one of these rockets, for a Delta IV or an Atlas V. You know, it still costs as much to launch the rocket, whether it has a two-ton or a five-ton payload. So I'm encouraged, I'm incentivized to develop as heavy a spacecraft as I can. Oh, which means I'm now building a spacecraft that costs ten times as much and takes four times longer to actually build. So the market had no elasticity. When you look at nanosatellites, however, the opposite is true. Unlike large spacecraft, nanosatellites are not infinitely divisible units. As a group, they are infinitely divisible. And not quite infinite, but you know what I mean. So, I could have 
a hundred CubeSats fly on, a, fly on a Falcon 9, or I could have three fly on an Analauncher. What does that mean? Well, that would be 33 nano launches versus one Falcon 9. That gives us economies of scale in our flight rate and manufacturing. We can optimize our factory to produce at its most efficient. We can optimize our launch operations to launch at their most efficient, which is more than you know one or five launches per year. Uh, we have a lot, we have we have what we call market elasticity in there because the demand is there. This is what the large launch industry doesn't have. The demand for nano satellite launch is sufficient to where we could scale and produce and launch 200 nano launchers per year and still not have saturated the market. SpaceX if they had fact factory capability to produce 200 Falcon 9s per year, they could do it. One, they have to they have the capex to spend to expand their production capability, but 200 Falcon 9 launches per year, even if even if 160 of those are reused Falcon 9s. Uh, Falcon 9 first stages, not the upper stages, which are not reusable. 200 per year, uh, there's not the demand in that part of the market. There aren't that many of those large spacecraft being launched per year, and there's not going to be for the foreseeable future. There's not going to be this magic demand suddenly show up in three years. So they don't have the flexibility uh, in the market uh, that, a, that a nano launcher actually has. And fundamentally it comes down to the fact that at nano satellite scale, the cost of launch is still much greater than the cost of the spacecraft itself. So reducing the cost of launch through mass production and high flight rate is doable and and competitive and profitable without increasing the cost of the spacecraft. The large spacecraft side of the market, the cost of launch is a fraction of the cost of the spacecraft. I might have a spacecraft that my company spent $500 million on or even just a hundred million dollars. But I'm paying SpaceX less than 50 to launch it. With a nanosatellite, it may cost me 100,000 or 200,000 to build it, but a million dollars or more to launch. So we have economies of scale that we can put into play with nanosatellite launch that is not available to large spacecraft because of the restricted demand. With a large spacecraft market, the dollar value of the market is huge, billions of dollars a year. But the number of launches is still small. Oh yeah, SpaceX will launch 40 times this year. Well, almost all of those launches are either for NASA or Starlink. I don't consider Starlink flights commercial launches. SpaceX is launching their own stuff. And NASA, even though it's procured commercially, it's not a commercial launch, really. So we have a relatively small number of launches that are very expensive still. And even a Falcon 9 at $50 million is way too expensive. Um, if it weren't, uh, SpaceX may not be developing Starship. Because even though it's supposed to go to Mars, it's also going to be an Earth orbit launch vehicle. So we look at 2017, keeping in mind that this presentation is like three years old. Um, the launch market was $350 billion. There were only 90 launches, 28 launch vehicle types, and eight nations. At 
in in 2019, I believe, or yeah, in 2019, there was almost 300 nano satellites launched, uh, and that's only increasing. So building larger spacecraft will only decrease the number of launches unless elasticity allows the market to expand. And for the large spacecraft market, it is not expanding. There is not an increase in demand. With nanosatellites, there still is. We're going from a two to 300 uh, nanosatellites launched per year this year, uh, maybe even more than that to over 3,000 projected annually by 2030. Will it end up being that many? You know, probably not, but it'll still be like 25, 26, 2700. So that is an advantage for nanosatellites. And then obviously the cost of the space vehicles. The uh, nanosatellites are just cheaper to produce. And not just because they're smaller, but because, and not because they're simpler, necessarily, although that factors into it, but because they can be mass-produced in much, much greater quantities. If I had a two-ton large spacecraft, you know, it could cost $200 million. If I had two tons worth of nanosatellites, you know, each nanosatellite, you know, costing as little as it does. We see that, in general, the cost is is lower uh, for the for those space vehicles and and for the launch vehicles as well. And this is why the figure that has historically been used, cost per kilogram to orbit, doesn't apply as much to nano launchers because there are much fewer kilograms being launched and the cost of launch is a lot higher. In the end, the customer doesn't care how much per kilogram because they're not designing per kilogram. They're designing for a mission. The large spacecraft, they can shave off 100 pounds here and there as they need. But again, that doesn't make their launch cheaper because the launch is priced based on much more than just the mass of the spacecraft. Um, you know, and, and that's that's also very important to remember. So we talked about elasticity. So how do we generate demand? Uh, the current launch market is still uh, considered to be overcrowded. I don't think it really is. There are, there are you know, 150 or whatever it is now companies purporting to be launched companies. Only a handful are flying, and there's still much greater demand than the market is uh, supplying. But that's going to change over the coming years as more companies do get to market. One thing to note for most of these companies, if not all, they're dependent on a high launch rate to recover their costs, their DD and E and operational costs. More than 50, more than 100 uh, at the nano launcher scale. If they can't launch it at such a high rate, they go out of business. They already have price reductions eating to their profit margin, high company overhead, uh, you know, and and most business plans cannot survive without uh, what I'll call subsidies, not just government subsidies, but um, R and D grants from the government that aren't directly related to launch, uh, additional investment. A lot of these companies, once they do even commercialize and are operational, they need investment not just to grow, but they need investment still to just survive. Revenue alone won't do it. So the way we see it is downscaling. 
is the best viable path for demand generation in the current and projected nanosatellite market. Downscaling the launch vehicle, flying fewer payloads, not only provides benefits to the customer in terms of uh, orbital and mission flexibility, but we can serve a greater demand which helps in part generate greater demand and the technical advantages of a nano launcher make more mission types feasible and at higher scale. This is something that the large launch vehicle industry uh, cannot take advantage of. There's ina inadequate flexibility in that upper range to support much more R&D than already exists due to the high capital expenditure, you know, a billion dollars to develop a new rocket. Um, and there's not demand. And at some point, your large launch vehicle is serving such a high payload capacity, such a general purpose vehicle will do anything for anybody, that it can't really do anything for anybody well. And I'm looking at Starship about this. You know, they're talking about, oh, point-to-point -point suborbital, uh, constellation deployment, human space flight, going to the moon, going to Mars, doing everything. Starship can do everything we need. I'm old enough to remember when they said the same thing about the space shuttle, and we see how well that worked out. You can go to a museum and find out. So, as we look at the, the industry and market uh, requirements and circumstances in our industry today, with so many companies developing nano launchers, we see that launch vehicle development has actually become fairly predictable. It is no longer a 10 year timeline of massive design changes, prototyping test, fail, build, test again, fail again, build, you know, and 10 years to get to orbit. Uh, Rocket Lab got to orbit in about three years, or, yeah. Um, SpaceX, it took six years, because they had three launch failures, uh, but that's becoming more an exception than the rule. Uh, Astros also had a few failures, so I take back what I just said, but they got to the launch pad uh, in about three years as well. And we know how to design a rocket. A rocket is a rocket is a rocket. We're not, we're, the industry is no longer learning how to build rockets. We're learning how to build them faster and cheaper. There's a big difference. So investment becomes more like real estate. You have a long wait time before you return on investment. For example, a planned community development takes decades to get the ROI. But it's collecting rent during that process, and the income is stable. And that's what is most important you know, in, in, the, in the early years. So in a sense, uh, companies like, uh, like mine, we're looking for the next neighborhood to build our rockets, which would be the next market. Uh, just like a planned community targets a certain demographic, uh, so are we. Um, and hopefully multiple demographics. Now, there's a perception that investors don't want to invest in launch companies anymore. Uh, with traditional large VC firms, especially in the United States, that is not true. I mean, that is true, uh, because those firms, you know, Goldman Sachs and such, they've already made their investments, whether, whether it's Rocket Lab, Astro, SpaceX, whatever, and they're not looking to invest in more. They're not looking to invest in competitors to their existing portfolio. But all you have to do is look at the news day by day, week by week, there's still a lot of investment going into launch, globally and in the United States. It's being done more by smaller VC firms, angel investors, 
Um, but this is a really exciting time for space. And like I said, nothing nothing attracts a crowd like success. And they see SpaceX and other things going on, and a lot more investors want to get on board. But it's just not going to be, you know, a hundred fifty million dollar check from Goldman Sachs. Um, you you might get that in your Series C or Series D round, but they're not going to be on the early stage. Um, one of the challenges there's a lack of innovation. Uh, you see this and look at the spectrum of companies and their plans in the industry. A lot of them are doing the same methodology over and over and over again to different market segments and even the same market segments. Uh, they're not even reinventing a wheel, they're just building the wheel again in a different factory. Then you have the companies who are, who are trying uh, to differentiate themselves with their technology and they're going too far. Their business model and their technology simply are not viable. They are in effect promising to invent unobtainium. Uh, they'll make gold out of lead. They're, they're practicing alchemy and they're just not realistic, which does hurt the rest of us because for every, I don't want to say wacko, but for every every entrepreneur that they're so focused on their neat idea that they don't actually do analyses to see if it's doable or even economically feasible. It ruins the credibility for the rest of us. It's kind of a guilt by association uh, syndrome. So then the challenge is how do you differentiate yourself while not being so out there that you won't be taken seriously. Um, that's another thing that we focus on. And it's not just the technology, it is the business model. You know, how is your business model differentiated? Um, and we think we're doing a good job on that. So, with all of that, and I know this is now going on two hours, our history. So we go back to our original question. What is the smallest orbital rocket you can build, and in parentheses, and make a profit? That's the biggest question. Here's our answer. It's the Helios launch vehicle. It's a three-stage advanced reusable nano launcher can carry 100 kilograms to a 400 kilometer sun synchronous orbit with options for uh, escape trajectories. The first stage uses a pump-fed aerospike engine with eight combustors on it. Uh, the CAD is a little outdated. Lightweight, low-cost, mass-produced aluminum and composite structures autonomous flight termination system that we have licensed out from the government, low-cost COTS-based avionics, which we have also licensed out from the government, and it is designed from scratch for scaled production. That is key. We need to be able to scale up our production rate and have our costs go up less than linear linearly. So we don't need to double our labor force to double our production rate. We don't need to double our factory size to double our production rate. Same, same labor force, same factory. The primary additional cost is just in the materials, but that still results in a vehicle production cost that as we produce more of them, the cost per unit goes down. We do believe this is about the smallest viable, uh, economically viable nano launcher that you can build. Uh, fully fueled, the mass is around eight tons. Uh, over seven tons of that is just the propellant, so we have a good mass fraction. Height, about 11 meters. Maximum diameter of one 
and a quarter meters. Our propellants are hypergolic, so they ignite on contact. It's also a green propulsion system. It's environmentally friendly, non-toxic. It's storable at room temperature. This greatly reduces costs by not having cryogenic components. The valves are cheaper. Uh, your insurance is cheaper. Your handling procedures are more streamlined and cheaper. Um, it is cheaper and more reliable than something like liquid oxygen and RP-1. And again, it, it, it is fully a green propulsion system. It is more environmentally friendly than the standard bearer of LOX and methane. And we do not, since we do not use methane, we are not supporting methane production, which the United Nations recently uh, declared the greatest near-term threat to the Earth's, Earth's climate. Um, so while that's not necessarily a concern that customers have, uh, we do want to be a responsible, forward-looking company. So we have standard CubeSat deployer. We can accommodate custom payloads, though. Payloads can be powered on throughout processing and launch, which is something that is not usually available with rideshare missions on, on large launch vehicles. Uh, stage 2 and Stage 3 are use common systems to the first stage. There's commonality throughout, uh, which also lowers costs and increases uh, production efficiencies uh, and increases reliability. Instead of three types of engines, we have one. Uh, that's, that's also extremely um, extremely important, not just in terms of your overall cost of manufacturing, but for uh, reliability. Um, th this, this is one reason you know, why the Falcon 9 uses uh, Merlins on both stages. Yeah, the Merlin, the MVAC is modified to operate in a vacuum, but it's still fundamentally the same Merlin engine. So reusability is key. If we're going to scale our flight rate, we can't be in a position where we have to continually expand our factory and hire more people to build more vehicles. More importantly, if we have to scale down the flight rate, we don't want to have unused manufacturing capability, and we don't want we don't want to be laying off employees we don't need anymore because we don't need to manufacture as much. So to stabilize our overhead in our factory and our workforce, the first stage is reusable. We still need to produce new upper stages for every mission, um, but the first stage is reusable. So we can expand our flight rate without enlarging our factory. We can reduce the flight rate without closing part of our factory. Uh, it, it results in a lot more stability, which gives a lot more financial stability um, and enables uh, dramatic uh, cost efficiency optimization, which directly translates into a better launch price for the customer. Uh, you know, the industry is coming to the uh, consensus that reusability is key to the future. It needs to not be a neat feature of one or two companies, but really for everybody. It needs to be a standard mode of operation. Um, and another shout out to Rocket Lab today. They did recover the first stage of their Electron rocket. Uh, that was the one bit of good news after the uh, after the mission failure. Uh, the first stage did not fail; it performed perfectly, and it re-entered and parachuted into the ocean. And they went and picked it up. So, where where is the market, and where is the market going? So we're looking primarily at CubeSats. Uh, 
because of the lack of launch availability and flexibility, Rise Share is not flexible, ISS deployment is not flexible. Uh, CubeSats have been largely limited to missions in low Earth orbit, mostly equatorial orbit. So, you know, communications, Earth imagery, IoT, and that's, and, and research. And that's about it. With a dedicated nano launcher, an inexpensive dedicated launch, and capabilities beyond low Earth orbit, the nano satellite community and the market demand can expand beyond LEO. Whether it's asteroid prospecting, space debris removal, uh, setting up a communications network around the moon or Mars for different landers and rovers, um, putting up a massive radio telescope around one of the Earth's Sun Lagrange points. How about that for a novel idea? So, as the launch options expand for the market, new form factors are developed, new spacecraft concepts, new payload concepts, new mission concepts are developed, becoming more imaginative. Uh, and then this, in turn, drives the need for even more flexibility. But instead of like the large launch vehicle and payload industry, which I showed you that death spiral of cost they're in, uh, for nanosatellites and the nano launch uh, industry, it's a productive and synergistic cycle. We enable more mission types by enabling more flexibility and as more mission types are invented and developed we end up being more flexible to meet that additional demand and we can do that because we operate at such a small scale. Uh, an Atlas V couldn't do that. I touched on this a couple slides ago Cost of operation. Once you've amortized your R&D, what are your operational costs? Your, your, your cost of goods sold, your hardware and labor um, are primary drivers. So for us, we use the non-toxic hypergolic propellant, storability, minimize environmental impact, which there's a huge cost associated with that. Minimize number of parts, obviously reduces cost, but also increases reliability. Minimize pyros and hazardous ops, and launch on a regular basis. And then, what I don't think many consider is low integration cost, rapid integration, and at low cost. Um, by maximizing, or in some cases minimizing these, uh, we can reduce and optimize the cost of operation of a nano launcher. So back to reusability. Cost reduction by economies of scale, like manufacturing the upper stages, plus selective hardware reuse, the first stage, is where the cost volume curve provides diminishing returns. Now this seems that it goes against us, but actually works in our favor because we achieve dramatic cost reduction by reusing the first stage. If we tried and even if we succeeded to make the second stage reusable, that wouldn't provide as much of a return to us. Uh, I'll give one real-world example that just came through the, the, the media recently. SpaceX has stopped uh, catching the, the payload fairings on the boat. They're going and picking them up out of the ocean. If it survives, it survives. If it can be reused, it'll be reused. But there's not enough of a return to justify the overhead of maintaining the two boats um, 
you know, and, and, and all of that process. So we believe that with current technologies, nano launcher reusability is doable and inexpensive. Many uh, pundits say you cannot do it with a launch vehicle your size. Um, especially, especially if you're doing powered descent and landing. Well, they said the same thing about the Falcon 9. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave their words for what they are. Uh, we do have prior examples. Uh, Falcon 9, other suborbital systems. Uh, we, know, we know it can be done. It's how do you do it, and how do you do it successfully? And there are new technologies, uh, machine learning, new modeling techniques, new uh, propellant feed system, more efficient feed systems, um, which are also enabling factors for reusability. You know, and ultimately, for the first stage of our vehicle to be reusable, we may need to increase the propellant load. We'll still have an extremely small vehicle, though. It's not like we'll be doubling the size of the rocket and tripling its cost. Uh, it may be a bit larger to accommodate 10% more propellant. We can accommodate that and still have a tiny, relatively launch vehicle. Another thing that enables this is the technical development cost and risk are a lot a lot less for a nano launcher than a ULA Vulcan rocket. Much the, the investment required in the R&D is a lot less. Plus the operational costs are a lot less for a nano launcher. And again, reusability is inevitable. Um, full reusability is inevitable. Uh, launch costs can only go so low before you have to go fully reusable to decrease them further. With reusability, uh, for a dedicated nano launcher, now it's possible that launch cost, launch price could go below $50,000 per launch, but only if the launch flight rate, annual flight rate, is high enough and regulatory red tape and overhead burdens are reduced. And that is the regulatory, uh, I'll have another lecture regarding that because that is also undergoing um, fundamental and revolutionary change in the United States right now. And then I, I should mention production automation. We do have the requirement to operate with a lead, a lean team. We can only do that if we have uh, some of our processes automated. <coughs> Fully automate, full automation is the ultimate goal. Um, it's not practical though uh, for business reasons, uh, but for engineering that's the ultimate goal. You know, make a thousand rockets a year. Uh, but partial automation still results in significant cost savings when combined with industrial slash commercial production techniques. So uh, look at your typical General Motors auto plant. Uh, there's a combination of robotics and people. And they balance that to maintain their maximum production efficiency. And as a side note, interchangeable parts, common components, industry standard components, producing at as something akin to a light industrial facility rather than a massive factory. Uh, if you've ever visited uh, Rocketdyne's factory or ULA uh, or SpaceX, 
Um, we need, for a nano launcher, we need to operate at a much smaller light industrial scale, as though we were making cell phones on an assembly line. Uh, th that's all about driving down the overhead, um, overhead and operational costs. Here's an example uh, slide we got from a presentation by OneWeb. Uh, about their factory and automation. I won't go into this. You can pause the video and take a look if you want. You can find this online anyway. And relating to monetizing everything as I talked about uh, and minimum viable products, as we develop the orbital launch vehicle we will be doing suborbital test flights at a small scale. Um, and because we're going to be launching these anyway and making these anyway, <coughs> we see there's a business opportunity to also offer a suborbital research rocket utilizing a single engine and a single stage to take 10, kilo, 10 kilograms uh, to about a hundred mile altitude. Um, we need that for our own, our internal R&D efforts, but if we're building these anyway, if we can put it out to market and generate revenue, profitable revenue from it, we will do that. Um, it, if it ends up not being profitable or it takes away from Helios R&D, then we won't. That's just going to be a business decision. We've already developed uh, and tested. Uh, well, I've been on the team that developed and tested uh, low-cost 9.5 kilonewton thrust engine. It uses a pintle injector ablative chamber uh, because it was cheaper, and uh, we could have that manufactured a lot quicker than a regenerative cooling system. It was very cheap. Uh, and we were able to prove out our propellant, uh, our unique proprietary propellant, uh, as well as some, um, some of our fundamental design features. So as you see, here's the evolution. Uh, single chamber on a suborbital vehicle. We have eight on the first stage of Helio. Single chamber on the second and third stage. Uh, Electronics, avionics, production techniques are all directly applicable from the suborbital vehicle to the orbital vehicle. So essentially, we it's almost like just a scaling operation to go from suborbital to orbital. But in reality, we're designing the orbital vehicle and scaling it down to these test vehicles during our development process. And then monetizing both in the end, hopefully. Because in the end, our business objective is end-to-end -end space utilization. Spacecraft hardware, spacecraft software, mission operations software, uh, suborbital sub launch, orbital launch, mission support services, um, really the, the full life cycle of not just a satellite and not just a mission, but the full life cycle of the customer's business from their from their product or service conceptualization through design, development, production, launch, on orbit, and then on orbit uh, support long term. That's our vision in a way. So now what looking to the future, what can we expect? Well the large launch vehicles uh, may slightly increase in launch rate, but it's shown to be pretty static in recent years. Uh, Starship and New Glenn from Blue Origin might change that a bit, but they're also launch systems in a whole class of their own. Uh, for as long as billionaires continue to back ventures and political imperatives exist, uh, exploration will thrive. It will continue and uh, Hopefully in the not too distant future we will be on Mars. 
Um, and this will also help uh, support the commercial industry as well, because these billionaires and, and others, they invest in companies with these grand plans, but these companies also offer, you know, low Earth orbit launch. Small satellites will dominate, I believe, as the first mode of business in space, especially nano satellites. There will be a lot more of them than the large spacecraft, and they will be doing a lot more diverse mission profiles than they are currently today. Um, and as more capabilities can be packed into smaller volumes, that trend will only increase. But markets being what they are, economies being what they are, um, there could be massive, uh, massive failures. What if, for example, Starlink turns out to not be commercially viable? Uh, I've seen some negative reviews about the connectivity and level of service uh, the technology provides. What if that fails? Will that also take down all of the other companies developing these constellations? And then what would that do to the launch industry? What would it do to SpaceX's launch business? Um, nanosatellites. If the cost for launch of larger spacecraft, perhaps on a starship, decrease enough to the point where the cost of launching a 10 kilogram nanosatellite versus a 200 kilogram small satellite is only a few thousand dollars, will that kill off the nanosatellite? We don't know, and we don't know what we don't know. And looking back over the past year, um, we have to be ready for anything. The industry has to be ready for anything and adapt. Uh, in our case, if we needed to scale up our vehicle payload capacity to meet the sweet spot of the market, we would be able to do that pretty efficiently and cost-effectively. We've already, we've already looked at that because uh, in our industry every launch company gets pressured to carry more and more and more payload. We're sort of a, a black sheep in that, in that we have refused to increase our capacity of our design beyond 100 kilograms. We have the market we're intending to address in the way we intend to address it for the reasons we intend to address it. That is our business model and that's what we're sticking with. But who knows what it's going to be like five years from now. We just don't. And on that uncertain note, I will thank you all for watching. Uh, please feel free to visit our website, although it is getting redone uh, as, I, as I speak so you may see some things changing on it. Um, and reach out if you have any questions. And I will be doing more of these lectures in the future, and hopefully they will not be two hours long again. <laughs> but thank you. If, if you've lasted this long, I really appreciate it. Thanks.